Rats as big as cats. Rampant roach infestations. Hazardous mold everywhere. Those are just a few of the many horrifying conditions that Staten Islanders living in government-subsidized housing complexes have endured in recent years. I open my refrigerator, and the roaches meet me at the door. We should be living like this. You pay rent like anybody else. You should live like this. Welcome to the Staten Island Advances from the Scene, a podcast bringing you an inside look at the biggest stories on Staten Island with the reporters who cover them. I'm your host, Eric Bascom, and this week I'm joined by Staten Island Advance public interest and advocacy reporter Giovanni Alves to discuss her ongoing coverage of the dangerous living conditions faced by many Staten Islanders. Thanks for joining me today, Giovanni. I'm so happy we're finally able to get you on the podcast. Uh, you've only been with the Advance for a pretty short time, uh, but you've already done some really impactful reporting, and we're ver- obviously very lucky to have you on the team. Thank you uh, for having me. As I mentioned earlier, you've already done some really important reporting in your first few months, perhaps most notably the series I want to talk about today on the NYC subsidized housing crisis. And so let's start getting into some of the specifics and uh, some of what you heard and saw when speaking to these residents. So in early November, you met with with a number of people at the Park Hill Apartments to talk about some of these issues, see some of these issues. What was that meeting like and, and what did you see and hear during your time there? Um, Prince Thomas, one of the uh, contacts that I mentioned in, in the story, um, he hosted the meeting. So it was like six or seven um, residents that stopped by and we you know, pretty much all sat in the living room and um, it was like a group interview. I just, you know, hit record and was taking notes, asking, you know, all any and all of the issues. Um, so some of them talked about specific issues to their apartments, as well as um, around the building, whether that's in the hallways or like issues with the elevators not working or um, outside some of the lights near the ramps or the stairs not working. So at the time, the heat wasn't on. So he had pots of water boiling on the stove to uh, (laughs) circulate some kind of heat. There were tiles coming up from his floor. There was unfinished, um, you know, plumbing work that was done in the bathroom. There was a window that was cracked that hadn't been fixed or resolved. And oftentimes what happens is the, it's not so much that management is unresponsive as much as the the time that it takes to get work done or work being started and not finished. Um, There were a couple other residents that mentioned, you know, having holes in their bathroom ceilings from when there was a leak from a pipe and the ceiling caved in and the work not being completed, which obviously is is a hazard. Yeah. And so a few weeks later, these same residents held a rally to kind of protest these conditions. Can you tell us a little more about that rally and, and what happened that day? Sure. So every it varies with properties depending on how well they're um, scoring with inspections. But HUD, you know, does periodic inspections of these properties to make sure everything is, you know, up to date, um, safe and up to code. And so they knew that um, a HUD inspection was coming up. And so the plan was to, um, you know, meet the inspectors and basically let them know these are the issues like you might not see this during the tour, but this is what's actually going on, what we're facing, what we're dealing with and hoping to get a response from HUD, you know, to be heard and potentially have some of these changes um, made. And so they actually had like blown up poster board pictures of some of the conditions so you could see like the the holes like I talked about in the bathroom 
or um, like the decrepit parts of the hallway, mold situations like that. And obviously seeing like a huge, I don't know, like maybe three by three kind of picture of it is, is very bold and catches your attention. Mm -hmm. And um, Councilman Rose was there. So she, uh, this is an issue that she's been aware of. She's been um, working with management and the owners for, for years, basically most of her time in office. Um, to address some of these issues. And there have been periods where, uh, I believe it was 2019, there was another rally, similar situation. And there was a town hall that was held and the owner made some promises about new appliances and elevators being replaced and renovations that needed to be done. And the elevators were replaced at one point, but there's oftentimes what happens is you know they might work for a week or two and then again they're not working but the big renovations that needed to take place like you know the overhaul with the pipe system for example mm -hmm. um that obviously is is a bigger job requires more planning requires more um capital and so those jobs have, have not taken place um so the residents feel that you know there was promises that weren't um you know, followed through on and maybe this time something, something will be different. And the uh, HUD inspectors, sometimes they contract out um, to other right. companies for inspectors to come. So that was another thing that, you know, these residents think they might be talking to HUD personnel and they were potentially from another, um, you know, like a third party and just doing the inspections on, on HUD's behalf. But the inspectors went into the management office and refused to start the inspection until the rally was over because they felt uh, intimidated. Um, that's what Councilman Rose was told. Um, she was in the management office, so that's what they told her, and she relayed that to the crowd. It's a shame that they feel intimidated by the tenants who just want to talk about how terrible their living conditions are. They, they didn't want to start the inspection. So basically they were like hiding out <laughs> in the management yeah, yeah. office. The wow. door actually locked and everything um, because they you know didn't feel safe. So Councilman Rose went into the management office. And so they actually had the owner on the phone. And then they have the inspectors there like, you know, what are we going to do about this? Um, right. Residents have said, you know, they don't think it's random that they handpick the ones that are in the best condition. So the inspectors aren't aware of all of these issues that they're talking about. And so they wanted the inspectors to come see their apartments, come see, you know, the fault, the, the mold in the corner and, and the ceiling falling in and other mm -hmm. issues like that. Um, and actually... The management, I guess it was the manager, ended up locking the door to the office again. So Councilwoman <laughs> Rose was actually locked out of the office. Um, wow. Eventually they let her back in and basically they said, we're, we're closing the office for the day. Like, we, we need you to leave. Um, so obviously <laughs> things didn't really get, not much changed on, on that day. We'll be right back. The Mayor of Maple Avenue is a powerful multi-part podcast about Sean Sinisey, a victim of former Penn State football coach Jerry Sandusky, who was arrested 10 years ago for numerous child sexual abuse charges. The podcast series is written and hosted by Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Sarah Gannam, who takes listeners into the world of addiction rehabilitation, where society can be quick to celebrate the consequences for abusers while not addressing the needs of their victims. Subscribe now to The Mayor of Maple Avenue wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, obviously there, there's still a lot of work to be done there, but let, let's move on to the second story in the series, which discusses some of the issues at Richmond Gardens in New Brighton, uh, where many say that there were some serious infestation issues, right? So what, what did you hear about kind of the rats and the roaches that the people deal with at this, uh, at this complex? Um, we also went to this property. So we didn't see the roaches firsthand because, you know, we were there during the day and roaches are usually uh, more active at night. But outside um, on the lawn, you could see 
the holes from where rats, you know, burrow into the ground and they're massive. Um, there's some photos in, in the article. Um, but a few of the residents, you know, had said this hasn't always been an issue. So the most recent man, the current management company, um, they've been there since I believe 2012. Mm -hmm. And so some of these residents have been there since, you know, some of them for 10 years, some of them 20 years. One resident, she's actually lived there since the apartments were built in 1984. Wow. Um, So she's seen companies. Seen it all. Yeah. Yeah. And she was saying how the owners and the managers before, um, they weren't seeing issues like this, such as the, the infestations. Um, is that a direct correlation with the company? I mean, obviously they didn't bring it with them, but in terms of things being addressed, it seems to be worse. And, um, yeah, they said that roaches, like you might see, um, one, one resident had said like in five years, maybe she would see one or two previously. And now it's more like five a day. Oh my God. Um, Yeah, which is, you know, obviously unsettling. Um, She had pointed out, like, in the corner of the ceiling, um, like, roach eggs. And then, uh, (laughs) yeah, Jason, who was there with me, um, he was doing the photography. He uh, pointed out, and we were both looking on the wall, like, am I seeing what I'm seeing? There was a roach that was, like, painted over. So oh, I don't know yes, I saw I saw like, that photo in the in the article. That was unreal. Yeah. Unreal. Yeah, literally a roach that had been uh painted over. Um so clear signs that that they were there. Yeah. Um and in terms of rats, so Ivory, my primary contact there, um mentioned that like her cat has caught some mice. Um but both her cat and her dog are, are actually scared of the the rats, which I don't I don't blame them. New York rats are Rats are huge. Um, another resident mentioned actually going out and, you know, buying or adopting a cat to deal with the rat issue. Um, some have said at night they could hear, like, the scratching in the walls um, from the rats. Yeah. And then another thing that was, like, you know, really unsettling is when you go to throw the trash out, you um, towards the end of the block it's like an enclosed area and then you have you know the trash hands that's where people are are putting their trash and there's a lot of rats that hang out there and so when we met with some of the residents they were saying they're scared to go out at night um like they don't you know put their trash trash out out. at night yeah yeah because of how many rats are there and like some of them mentioned you know tossing the garbage bags from a distance yeah to not get too close run out (laughs) Oh yeah, the rats God. would, like, run out when they uh, put the trash out. And then I actually saw a video of the rats basically, like, just hanging out. Like, one was on the, the rim of the garbage can. One was, you know, towards the bottom. Um, so they're a regular occurrence there. But my contact, actually, she just called me this morning. Um, she said she was going to send some more videos. It's, it's worse that there's there's more rats that are out there. And also people are concerned about more rats with it being so cold out, you know, they're burrowing and they're more likely to come. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's wild and it's unfortunate, you know, people shouldn't have to deal with that. That's. Yeah, absolutely. Scary. I mean, the, obviously it's a terrible situation. No one should have to deal with that. But when I was reading your article, the, the point about the cats really just got me for a second. I thought it was so funny that one of the residents said, you know, that's so bad that I got a cat to deal with it. And the other resident said, it's so bad. My cats are literally afraid of these rats. And I was like, yeah. I guess there's two types of cats out there. But yes, ob- <laughs> obviously no one should have to be recruiting the help of, of felines to deal with their uh, with their rat issues. So let's move on to another issue, though. Y- you also said that some of the residents there have told you that there have been extended periods of time without heat, without hot water, and that some of the residents, we touched on this earlier, have said that it has either led to or exasperated some of their uh, health issues. So what more can you tell us about that? Yeah, so Ivory, the main contact, she uh, has respiratory issues. Um, pre-existing but basically like we said they were exacerbated um, by the conditions in the home whether it's um, reoccurring mold which has been painted over 
um, actually plastered over, but management never came back to paint. <laughs> um, but yeah, so another thing too is she's, you know, spraying Lysol frequently to, to deal with that and worried about the, um, the air quality. But unfortunately that also, you know, doesn't help the quality of the air constantly breathing that in. Right. Um, actually a week, I want to say a week after the article ran, she was in the hospital with a lung infection. Wow. And she said that when she was home, she could, like, she can feel the difference that she doesn't feel as healthy or, like, that it bothers her breathing. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of, like, the periods without heat or hot water, she mentioned, you know, last year, there was weeks at a time that there was no heat. Um, similar to Park Hill, they'll have their stoves on um, or have the oven running and then, you know, cut it off when they go to sleep. So it's, you know, not on unattended. Hot water is, you know, can be a boiler issue. One resident mentioned that, you know, it was re resolved very quickly, like maybe within a few days, within a week, and that was fine. But then others, they went two weeks without hot water. Um, and it's, you know, different parts of the block at different times. So one week, you know, ivory side of the block, didn't have um, hot water mm -hmm. and then theirs was restored and then some of the neighbors across the street then they didn't have hot water they didn't have heat so you know they're going through the same things at different times um, there was I believe it was in October there was no heat for about a month wow. um, I mean during the day it was pretty warm but you know in the evening it does get cold and one of the older residents she uh, developed pneumonia over the course of that month um so you know obviously it's it's a health concern um especially for like people that might have more compromised immune systems or weaker immune systems like some of these elderly residents um that being a concern so yeah they'll they'll go periods without the heat or or hot water sometimes both um ivory when we first spoke in october was saying she was hoping something would change you know soon because another winter is approaching we're now in winter um and it's <laughs> it's cold like this week it's yeah oh really my god cold. it really and, i couldn't yeah. imagine living well it, it's funny because what, what stuck out to me is when we were discussing when you were just discussing the the lack of heat at certain times there there were instances when a resident told you oh it was only out for a couple of days it wasn't that bad and then there's other times when it's out for a couple of weeks obviously that's a bigger issue but even a couple of days particularly at times like this when we're having some of the coldest you know weather that we've had in years mm -hmm. th that's something that i think a lot of staten islanders couldn't imagine dealing with a, a going a couple of days without heat without hot water is something that I don't think the, the you know, day-to-day -day person is considering and, and realizing how much that can impact you and, and how difficult that can make your life and how much it, you know, opens you up to these potential health issues. So obviously very concerning uh, there, even dealing with it for short periods of time. But let's Let's move on. So on the podcast, we, we also like to give our listeners kind of a peek behind the curtain on the reporting process. So obviously a part of that and a part that you have done a great job with is the conversations that you've had with the residents, with the property owners, kind of getting that uh, on the ground reporting done. But another part that some people don't always consider is kind of the combing through the data like you did on this story to find all the open violations that were at this building. Can you just give our listeners some insight into that aspect of reporting and, and kind of where you found all this data, how long it took you to find what you were looking for, that kind of stuff? Sure. Um, so I've always kind of been a little bit of a research nerd, so this <laughs> is you know, kind of right up my alley. But um, when it comes to any property, there are public records with Department of Buildings, um, the City Department, Housing and Preservation Development. Um, those were the primary sources that I had, those two. I went to their websites and they have a database. You can you know, type in the address of the, the property and then um, all the information will come up. You can see uh, records of you know, violations that might have been resolved, cases that are outstanding and still open, um, and then the different classes of the violations. So, you know, how much of a safety issue they are, or how, um, 
I guess how quickly they need to be attended to, how urgent it is. Um, and it's, it's a lot of information. I mean, some of these were outstanding, you know, back to like 2012, 2013. Wow. I think what's so alarming about that is that these properties, the, the companies still own and still manage these properties and have violations that go back 10 years. Like, how does that happen? How does that work? Right. Um, and so I was, you know, combing through pretty much everything, looking for patterns with um, rat and roach infestations, for example. So also like cross-checking some of the things that I, you know, saw or like was told about by residents, you know, seeing it here in the, the actual, um, like seeing it in the numbers, but seeing it also in the cases and the data. Yeah, it's, it's really concerning. Um, one thing that was interesting, so I had mentioned, you know, the, the hot water situation um, right. in Richmond Gardens, and they actually have open violations for, so annually they're supposed to file a report um, about the, the status of the boiler, boiler system. And there was consecutive years, 2017, 2018, 2019, um, they did not file that report about the boiler, which is interesting. You're yeah. About, you know, hot water. Especially, working. right, <laughs> when hot working, water is the yeah. issue. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that stuff is, is so interesting because I think a lot of people, when they see our reporting and they see some of the, the data or the statistics that are in there, they kind of just assume like, oh, they reached out to, you know, that department and they gave them that information where it's like, no, you are literally going through Excel spreadsheets, some of which have, you know, thousands and thousands of, you know, different things in there and trying to pick out what you need and what you want and what's relevant and then trying to interpret that data, analyze it, um, you know, see how it compares to, to other things that you have. And so it, it really is a, a long, tedious part of the process that I think people don't always consider. Um, but I just always think that it's interesting mm-hmm. to kind of give people that insight. And so I don't want to spoil any of your upcoming articles, obviously, but I, I was just kind of wondering what comes next for this series. Are, are you working on anything right now that you can, you know, share with us that listeners should be on the lookout for? Um, so the latest is the Stapleton houses, the Mm -hmm. building, the entire building that is without cooking gas. So that's 96 households that have not had gas since March, which is mind blowing. Can you imagine going, you're talking about almost a year now without being able to use your stove and without your oven and how many holidays passed that people were not able to make, you know, holiday meals. Yeah. Um, some people were uh, using their barbecue grills on their balconies. NYCHA did supply hot plates, but you're going from, you know, four burners to one hot plate trying to cook for a family. Um, obviously, that's difficult. Um, so that's ongoing and uh, definitely something to keep keep an eye out for. People have been very receptive so far because I think it's, it's just so alarming that, you know, people are paying rent. Um, and utilities are included in their rent, they're paying right. for gas and they're not getting it um, and expected to, to just make do for, for that long. Um, and then we're hoping, you know, with follow-ups that maybe there will be some changes, some progress that HUD will be responsive. Um, you know, our officials have been, well, now Councilwoman Rose is, is out of office, so we're hoping Maybe Councilwoman Hanks will kind of like pick up the baton and run with it. Uh, Assemblymember Fall has been in talks with um, HUD, especially with like Park Hill, and then also NYCHA with the uh, Stapleton situation. They were able to get uh, community kitchens where people will be able to cook. I'm not sure if they've opened yet, but um, you know, trying to get other options um, for people to have. So, yeah, I would say, you know, keep an eye out for for the Stapleton story and, you know, hopefully these people have gas soon. Um, It could be as early as spring. Hopefully that that timeline is, you know, sticks. And um, yeah, yeah. So I'd say the the follow up now, like does what what changes we know about the issues it's out there. Um, these agencies are well aware of it. Yeah, the officials are clearly. aware of it. So, what what something has to be done. You can't just let that slide. 
Right. So hopefully we'll see, we'll see some improvements and changes and uh, more than just um, the readers <laughs> being alarmed and asking yeah. if they can help. And, you know, some things are our agency and government processes that obviously a, a reader can't, <laughs> can't really change that that much. So. Yep. And, and so just to wrap things up here, if there are any Staten Islanders who are living in these types of conditions that want to share their stories with you, what, what's the best way for them to reach out? Um, they can email me at g-a-l-v-e-s at siadvance.com. We'll be responsive and, and go from there. All right. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure talking to you and I hope to have you on again soon. Same here. Thank you again for having me. Yep, no problem. Did you know a federal quarantine station in Rosebank, which had inspected the health of every immigrant entering the United States through New York Harbor since the late 1880s, closed in 1971? Thank you for listening to the Staten Island Advances from the scene. If you like what you've heard, please make sure to rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit SILive.com for the latest on all these stories and more. Thank you for supporting local journalism.